we see objects and we see them interacting. And it is through their interactions with us that we're able to see them. But when we try to understand what an interaction actually is by watching matter closely, on any scale, we don't find much of an answer. Causal interactions consist generally of objects moving around in space, influencing one another. These movements and influences, and the states that they consist of, are precisely describable in terms of mathematical, measurable quantities of the objects, which are called variables and constants. Variables include the speed or velocity of objects, their charge, temperature, their mass energy, kinetic energy, and potential energy. There are also variables that describe relationships of objects, such as the distance between objects, strength of forces, and time. Also contributing to our description of interactions are the measurable constants of particles and fields. Other quantities are also useful to us, which are mathematical expressions of these variables. Sometimes we refer to variables and constants of particles as being properties or attributes, and we can divide them into states and trajectories the particles take in space. Physicists currently suppose that objects move and influence one another through a common force field, which is necessary for movement and interaction to take place. These force fields are composed of virtual particles, also referred to as force carriers. These force-carrying virtual particles are exchanged between objects, facilitating the interaction by contacting the respective boundaries of the objects. In fact, even in a supposedly direct collision, two objects might not actually touch at all. The particles in such an interaction might just come extremely close, with the virtual particles of the field in question doing the actual force exchange. We should start by defining interaction. The most basic definition offered is the direct and irreducible actions between particles. If we accept this, then what does an interaction consist of exactly? It begins with an object emitting a virtual particle. Then there is an observable change of value of one of the mathematical variables of the emitting object, for example, kinetic energy. We can call a particular value of a variable a state, and call a change of value a state transition. The virtual particle is then absorbed by another object. The two objects are subject to the momentum transfer between them, and the absorbing object likewise undergoes a state transition in terms of a measurable variable. It is at this point that we can say that the two particles have interacted, or that an action took place between them, as per our definition. If there is no observable, measurable change, it seems impossible to conceive of there being any interaction. It is a necessary condition that there is a detectable or measurable state transition for there to be an interaction. There are also believed to be self-interactions where both cause and effect are the same particle, but the principle is the same as this involves a state transition. So this gives us a way of defining state transitions for a given object and interactions between objects. This owes to the fact that the features of interaction we've described here are, in combination, sufficient and necessary conditions for being able to pinpoint an interaction. In addition, the concept of force carrier emission, or absorption, being the condition for state value change, serves the purpose of connecting the boundaries of the objects, as well as the purpose of providing interaction with a definition. Existing values, when they are unknown, as well as values that have changed in a state transition event between objects, have been found to be predicted by mathematical equations that describe physical laws. For example, certain inverse square laws provide universal means of repulsion and attraction, including Newton's law of gravitation, an attractive force, and Coulomb's law, which provides interactions that can repel or attract. Laws such as these give us a way of describing interactions with mathematical precision. The precision they provide us with, compared to our conventional language, is evidence that these laws are a part of what takes place in an interaction, at least somehow.
so why did I say at the beginning that the account of interaction I just gave doesn't provide a satisfactory answer for what interactions actually are? Because nothing here actually explains the order of events. To have an explanation, you need some principle or function that connects two states, or two events. You cannot explain something by simply pointing out what we observe in the situation and what follows it. As I said in the previous video, the necessary ingredient of explanations are laws, which we can call principles or functions. Their constituent relations are the explanatory factor. An explanation requires you to represent a relationship which might not be directly visible by placing into order two or more things in the form of a relation. An explanatory factor has to be something in which we are certain, or at the very least must be explained in turn by something we are certain about. So the purpose of inferring some new entity responsible for what you're trying to explain is to provide that certainty. But what principle connects the emission or absorption of a virtual particle at the object boundary with a variable of the object? And what reason is it that determines that force carrier emission or absorption necessitates that a variable such as its kinetic energy then just changes in value? Why is variable change conditional on this event of emission or absorption at the boundary? There's no in-principle connection. Boundaries are concrete, but variables are abstract. So how can we connect the two to explain what's going on? Even if we ignore the mathematical aspect of it that we describe, why should force carriers act on matter to move faster or slower? What's so important about the physical touching of the object boundary by the force carrier? Can't the state transition of the object occur before the force carrier hits or leaves the object boundary? Can't the momentum be transferred to the other object before the force carrier hits it? We're just meant to accept that this is what force carriers do to particles of matter, and in this exact sequence, simply because that's what's necessary for it to make sense to us. So when we consider how matter interacts, we are left wanting for an explanation because it does not actually collide. Remember that interactions are defined as direct and irreducible actions between particles. Yet when we infer the existence of force carriers which do collide with material boundaries, we are then left wanting for an explanation for why collision results in a change of some abstract mathematical value. And how come force carriers can obtain momentum all of a sudden after not even existing a moment before? Force carriers were proposed in the first place to explain the transfer of momentum. So how do they obtain their momentum? Force carrier emission is said to be spontaneous, but this is another way of saying that we don't know what causes it or what conditions it depends on, so it remains unexplained. We cannot explain what interactions are and why matter moves by just special pleadingly granting exemption to force carriers from the very principles we hold matter accountable to. This is why I said that we don't find much of an answer about what an interaction actually is by considering matter at its irreducible level. Whatever the answer to these questions turns out to be, it must be something in which we're certain. When confronted with these problems, reductionists will tend to hand wave the problem, saying that we're chasing our own tails or asking dead end questions with no real answers. They say that causal explanations, which employ laws of physics, are just descriptions of what we observe. This is the view of descriptivist empiricism, associated with the physicist Ernst Mach. Although descriptivist empiricism is not the same philosophy as reductionism, endorsing the latter quite naturally leads to endorsing the former, which reduces explanation to an act of description from observation. The reason why reductionists explain explanation in terms of descriptivist empiricism is because a reductionist would say that events on the macro scale, which of course includes our attempts to explain and describe interactions, are only composed of that which we can minimally discern or detect. To arrive at those descriptions, explanations and understandings, all we have to do is identify the fundamental components and interactions, 
scale them up, and generalize them. In other words, mathematical descriptions of causal events have no independent existence beyond their fundamentally discernible constituents. Because descriptions and explanations don't contain any other necessary component other than the fundamental interactions that are physically taking place. Because on reductionism, descriptions are susceptible to the same reduction that all macro-level events are susceptible to, it shouldn't be surprising if the vast majority of reductionists are also descriptivist empiricists. But how do the problems we encounter when trying to explain interactions from the bottom up relate to this view of descriptivist empiricism? Because reductionism leads to thinking that descriptions will ultimately boil down to unintelligible facts. This descriptivist view that science will lead to brute facts about interactions that are unexplainable has its basis in reductionism. Ernst Mach's descriptivist empiricism is, of course, incompatible with the notion that laws of nature are prescriptions, which our explanations can access, because it entails that explanations entirely reduce to descriptions, which contain no prescriptive element. But if being told that these questions can't be answered because fundamental interactions are just unintelligible doesn't satisfy us, how do we proceed? An important heuristic we learn from studying the structure of the CTMU is to begin by searching for degrees of invariance as a first step in reaching understanding. The answer is not to be found by considering matter on its smallest scale and at its most specific, but by considering that which is the most general. First off, the physical variables here are varying with respect to something that does not vary. They're varying within the bounds of certain established equations, insofar as we currently describe those equations. So the equations are invariant with respect to the variables that they relate. Second, the values of physical properties that we measure are always localized with the object. The values of those measured variables are more scientifically precise ways of describing the object's topology than the way in which we already see and experience the objects. So the variables or properties and their specific values are not separable from the boundary of the object. And that is also an invariant fact. Even when we describe relationships between objects, like radius or distance, it is still normalized to the boundaries of the objects considered. The physical variables an object has cannot be separated from the boundary of that object. You could almost say one is co-defined on the other. So this relationship between variables and boundaries is also everywhere present. In summary, the boundary of the object and the equations that describe the behavior of the object are invariantly associated. The question now becomes, what is the connection between the physical values the object instantiates, described by an equation, and some condition at the object boundary? As I said earlier, to form an explanation, the relata have to be expressed in a common principle containing a relation. So what terms do we express equations and values in? In mathematical terms. Then, is it possible to express a boundary in mathematical terms? It turns out that it is. We have a mathematically defined topology which is a set of points and a likewise definable subspace, which is a subset of that set of points. The subset of points can be expressed as a boundary line. In the conventional definition, the word limit is used, and a limit is a mathematical thing. So now what we have is the possibility to form a model of reality in which the boundaries of objects, along with their physical values, are actually the outputs of higher more invariant mathematical functions. And the functional ingredients of these aggregate functions are the equations governing physics. This should only become more convincing when we remember that objects never truly collide. Their boundaries don't actually touch. They just come within a certain range of each other. So the condition of one boundary touching another was never determining whether a force is exerted 
or a state change takes place to start with. The condition which actually determines trajectory change is in fact the distance between objects, which is taken as input by a higher order mathematical function. So, in what manner do these equations describing physical regularities exist? Let's consider the collision formulae which describe state transitions, unlike the previously mentioned inverse square laws that only tell us an unknown at a given time point. They allow us to predict, on the basis of the conservation of energy, the momentum and velocity of two colliding objects before and after a collision, or exchange of energy, with accuracy. So they allow us to accurately predict states we cannot currently see, because those states are in the hypothetical future. In the case of collision formulae, elastic or inelastic, we can accurately calculate a future velocity or momentum. All of the success of our engineering is based on this. But if, as reductionist and descriptivist empiricists claim, these laws and equations of physics only exist as just mere descriptions, then there is no reason why accurate prediction should ever take place or be possible. If laws and equations of physics have no independent existence beyond our imagination, then nothing is actually constraining the next physical state to fall within a range of values, which is what successful prediction depends on. On this explanation, every instance of laws and equations of physics turning out to work at all is one event of miraculous luck after another. It is a fallacy that nothing is responsible for the rearrangement of physical matter to fall within a range of values that our laws and equations of physics can predict with any degree of accuracy. Hence we can conclude that the opposite is the case. The fact that we can predict the values of physical states using equations before measuring them at all proves that those equations are describing, and in correspondence with, something that is prescriptively constraining those states. So this is the manner in which the laws and equations of physics exist, as the descriptive correspondence of how physical values are prescriptively rearranged. Prescriptive relating to the imposition or enforcement of a rule. What is that thing that is prescriptive? In what sense does it reside in the laws of physics? Is there a concept in some field of study which provides the explicit rules by which both the replacement of values takes place and boundaries are defined? Can such a thing explain how physical components and processes relate to each other? This introduces us to syntax. A syntax is the rules used for constructing complete sentences. In other words, syntax is the order or arrangement of words and phrases in the formation of proper sentences. To be exact, a syntax achieves this by separating words from each other, as well as symbols from each other, and finally, complete sentences from each other. This is necessary for there to be any order and arrangement of symbols and words within sentences at all. Thus, a syntax provides descriptive structure, in the form of distinct positions at which symbols may appear. With symbolic segregation at the various different levels provided, we have a basis on which to group symbolic elements. For example, letters of the alphabet can now be grouped into vowels and consonants according to which positions of the word they may occupy. At the sentence level of structure, the same allowance appears. With different positions within the sentence for words to occupy, comes the availability for the vocabulary of words to be segregated into word groups. The segregation of these word categories consists of which positions they are permitted to take. The basis of this reasoning was first demonstrated by Noam Chomsky in the 1950s in his book Syntactic Structures. Let's go through an example of what syntactic rules are. The composition of a simple sentence can be a noun phrase and verb phrase. The arrow represents substitution. The left is substituted, or replaced, by the right.
Likewise, the noun phrase and verb phrase each have a composition of their own. A noun phrase is composed of an article and a noun, while a verb phrase is composed of a verb and a noun phrase. Now these word categories and phrase categories that we see here are called syntactic categories. They are the structural units of the syntax. In this example, once we've reached the syntactic categories of article, noun and verb, there's only one substitution remaining until we have a formed sentence. At such a point, the syntactic category is substituted by symbols of the vocabulary, which are grouped according to which syntactic category they replace. When the syntactic rules have finished decomposing, they can only be replaced by a vocabulary symbol. For this reason, the vocabulary symbols, being the last to be substituted, are called terminals, because the substitution or decomposition has terminated. In contrast, the syntactic symbols composing the rules of the syntax and syntactic categories are referred to as non-terminals because they are replaced. Here we see an example of a production. The syntactic categories are stepwise replaced according to syntactic rules until we arrive at a terminal expression containing only symbols of the vocabulary. Now shown is the manner in which the descriptive structure of a sentence is provided by syntax. The sentence category actually serves as a start symbol, the most generic level of the structure, into which the other symbols are substituted. The sentence category in this case contains two syntactic categories. In reality they can contain more, but we have to keep it simple. The sentence category is replaced by the succeeding two in accordance with a syntactic rule. Notice that each syntactic category contains the categories it is replaced by. The number of categories it contains provides the branching structure. Each syntactic category is a position at which branching and replacement can take place until we reach the categories replaced by terminals. Now we can see that the syntactic categories are also sets. While those which contain other syntactic categories serve as branching positions and provide structure, the categories of verb, article and noun contain only terminals. This is illustrated by the membership symbol in between syntactic categories and terminals. There is something very important to notice here with regards to position and replacement. Because syntax contains syntactic categories which can in turn contain other syntactic categories, new positions within the syntax can be designated. It is the containment of more than one syntactic category by another that allows for a position to branch into more than one position. Eventually, there is a syntactic category which terminates in terminal symbols, from which the categories can be distinguished and inferred. But the fact that syntactic categories can each contain more than one terminal symbol, but only one may occupy that position in the syntax, is also important because it is what allows us to distinguish the transformation of one symbol into another. Specifically, it is the containment of non-terminal and terminal symbols by other non-terminal symbols that allows positions within the syntax to be horizontally distinguished, that is, for boundaries within the structure to be distinguished. But this kind of containment also allows for terminal symbols of a certain category to be mutually exclusive with one another, and thereby allowing those symbols to be seen to be transforming into one another at any given position. A syntax therefore supplies not only a basis for positional separation, or the arrangement within a structure, but also a basis for the concepts of transformation, substitution, and replacement within that structure. We earlier established that equations describing the laws of physics are invariant with respect to the variation of measured variables and that they correspond to some prescriptive nature that reality has in relation to measured variables in that they constrain the values of the next state of an interaction.
we also found that collisions or trajectories of particles are better explained if equations describe the higher order mathematical functions which act on the distances between objects and boundaries of objects interacting. So then, the question was, how can that which is prescriptive relate these components and processes together into a uniform explanation? We now know that syntaxes govern prescriptive rearrangement, so where would equations describing laws of physics fit within a syntax? In syntax, a string is reconfigured and replaced through what is called a production or a production rule. If a production rule is unknown, linguists derive it by working out the patterns in how sentences are generated. Likewise, physicists infer the algebra of an equation from the pattern of observable experimental information that they have. And exactly like production rules, an equation is a rule which mediates the replacement of input values with an output value. Hence, both equations in physics and production rules in syntax are unobservable, and both can be derived from their observed inputs and outputs. These observable inputs and outputs are the terminal symbols, which take an unambiguous position in the structure and are specifically identifiable. It only makes further sense for the values of measured physical variables to be terminal symbols, since an object cannot have two masses or two speeds at once. Equations of the laws of physics are our descriptions of the constraint that physical syntax prescribes over physical state. When we recognize that terminal symbols are in general contingent on the syntactic categories that contain them, we can answer yet another conundrum. Why are the properties or variables of an object normalized to the boundary of that object, or in the case of distance, the relationship between the boundaries of different objects? Because a terminal symbol cannot be extracted independently from the syntactic category to which it belongs. Stated alternatively, a terminal symbol is replaced within a non-terminal symbol according to a production rule which constrains its replacement. This in turn explains what an object boundary actually is. It is the syntactic category that contains the object's variables and all possible values, which vary with respect to that boundary. It is the highest level of the syntax at which objects are discernible, and further entails that a boundary condition is simply the surrounding syntactic structure. This shows us why equations describing the laws of physics are such good descriptors of the conditions of causation and collision. An equation is a production rule that distributes over an object boundary in the syntax. It also explains, finally, why it was never necessary for objects to directly collide in order to causally interact in the first place. The values of velocity and position are constrained by the syntactic categories that contain them. And this constraint is provided by what the physical equations describe. Since constraint means the same thing as prescription, this means that the syntactic structure containing these changing values is prescriptive over the values. So the equations describing physical interaction are, behind the scenes, constraining the trajectories of objects in a purely mathematical and syntactic way. In other words, the objects and their boundaries were already touching in syntax. We've also now summarized what a state transition is. It is the discernible and detectable substitution of one physical value for another. This requires both the positional separation provided by syntactic categories at the object, variable and value levels to discern the values, variables and objects from each other, and syntactic substitution to discern the changes in values. But where do force carriers or virtual particles fit into this? Is their emission spontaneous? The CTMU answers this question by showing that free will and conspansion allows communication to take place, but to understand how, we have to cover more topics within the CTMU. For the time being, we can conclude that force carriers are the intermediary between one terminal and another within the syntax. Considering them to even be particles is optional and potentially misleading. With syntax, we now have the unifying structure
in which we can distinguish a given object from another. Variables from different variables, values from different values, and time points from different time points. But does syntax encompass all interactions? Well, interactions uniformly take place in spacetime. And what the aforementioned proves is that spacetime is a syntax. Syntax provides the syntactic categories in which objects are discerned from one another, as well as the concept of substitution of symbols in the entire structure by which changes of those objects are collectively discerned. It's important to notice that syntactic substitution is qualitatively different to the categorical structure of the syntax. Syntactic categories and terminal symbols are positionally related to one another, while substitution, on the other hand, affects the entire structure at once, and its effects are distributed and observed across the whole terminal layer. Space and time have an analogous relationship, with objects situated in space and differ positionally, in contrast to time, which is capable of changing all objects regardless of position. This explains how it is that we come to see objects through their interactions with us. The physical world is a syntax, and we as observers are embedded in that very syntax. Some will argue that space-time cannot be a syntax, because a syntax is just the order of words. This misses the purpose of everything that has just been explained, which is to show that space-time is an example of syntax, just as the ordering of words in a sentence is. It is a fallacy to try to prove what reality is not, based on a definition in a dictionary. Definitions in dictionaries don't force reality to be a certain way, nor force reality to not be whatever dictionaries don't mention. Simply the fact that our current conception of syntax only applies within linguistics cannot prove reality not to be a syntax. We could have prematurely limited our application of the concept in error. There is a concept directly equivalent to at least one aspect of syntax, the production rules, in both mathematics and logic, by the name of rewrite rules. We cannot dismiss the application of language theory to physics, then, without incurring the cost of dismissing the application of mathematics and logic to physics for the same purposes. It is clearly better to accept the correspondence that language theory has in this case to physics, for the same reason that simply because it is mathematicians and logicians who study rewrite rules, this doesn't prevent a physicist from applying the concept. But the important point to underline here is that not only does space-time fit the definition and structure of a syntax, but more significantly, the syntax concept explains what not considering space-time as a syntax didn't explain. Appealing to dictionary definitions cannot undermine the authority that successful explanation affords. It is reason that is the authority on what things are, not dictionaries. Why is reason the authority? because it is reason that places something into an ordered relationship to what we already understand. An explanation does this by relating a term in a given order to the other terms in the linguistic structure. Recall that a relation orders members of a set into pairs. Hence, an explanation is successful if the ordering of terms by the syntax of the sentence is in exact correspondence to how reality orders what the terms refer to into pairs. It is this key ingredient that allows us to understand the state transitions and interactions underlying an object's behavior, whereas the act of description or definition merely state the outward characteristics of something or its place in another structure. Reason and explanation are references to the syntax underlying the nature of a phenomenon, and this syntactic structure is prescriptive because it determines what can and cannot happen. This means that Ernst Mach's reduction of explanations to mere description is false, and descriptivist empiricism is epistemically flawed. As previously explained, the terms of a sentence are placed into order by a syntax. So where do relations reside? Within the syntax of reality itself, of course. For the members of a set of things to be related, or for the sets and categories themselves to be related to one another, they must be mutually contained within a syntactic category.
It is this mutual containment as well as the production rules that transform the contents of the syntactic category that is exploited in the act of explanation. Mutual containment is required for any relation, whether that relation is in time, in space, or is abstract in nature. As stated earlier, a syntax provides descriptive structure. Descriptions, explanations, definitions, attributions, and so on, are all arrangements in the terminal phase of syntactic structure. But what about topological structure? Topological state requires positional separation, which as we know is provided by syntax. Furthermore, any transformation of that topology also requires syntactic substitution. It is for the very fact that both description and topology are governed by a syntax that we can acquire topology as perceptual state and infer the rules of those topological states using the syntax of reason. If the structure governing the organization of topological state were not the same as that governing our descriptions and explanations, then we would not be able to infer or describe anything from reality. We could only gawk at it in speechless confusion. So topology, together with its rules, are also a syntax. Now, of course, we cannot see the rules prescribing reality. We can only descriptively represent them. But this has wider implications. Reality contains both descriptions and topology. In the case of both, we have terminal states that are rearranged within syntactic categories. Since the syntax of either side accepts the states of the other, our transforming descriptions of the topology we see transforming in front of us are both contained by a structure which is therefore self-enclosed. Across the whole of reality, then, state and syntax everywhere coincide. There is no topological or descriptive state that is inaccessible to syntax, and what we have is a duality between syntax and state. What kind of duality is it, though? As mentioned in the previous video, attribution details the organization of attributes or properties on their arguments or objects. In attribution, objects are attributed to relations or structures. As we have covered, in both description and topology, an object is a part of a relational structure. Hence, syntax state duality is an attributive duality. Notice that syntax state duality is orthogonal to the map territory duality, or as we refer to it in the previous video, topological descriptive duality. The syntax on the descriptive side of the divide is the subjective and descriptive, while that of the topological side is the objective and the prescriptive. These correspond to the abstract and concrete phases of the topological and descriptive syntaxes. The thesis of this video was that analysing matter as it directly appears doesn't explain what interactions actually are. So far, we've established that to understand the relationships between our measurements of bodies of matter, their boundaries, and their state transformations, space-time must be considered as a syntax. We now know that relations depend on syntactic structure. But interactions are a very specific kind of relation between entities. Relations on their own don't tell us if two things will interact, since being related in terms of time or space or in abstract terms doesn't determine if an interaction takes place. Clearly, we need to clarify what interaction is here. At the very least, an interaction is a very specific kind of relation that exists within space. But if space-time is a syntax, how can objects accept one another as input for which to partake in an interaction? How do objects communicate with each other? To understand further how syntax explains interactions, we need to cover a couple of additional concepts, including the compartmentalization of objects in space-time and their accepting syntax. Thank you for your attention, and please share any insights or objections in the comments section below.